on the air with President Biden, hoping to find a message on inflation that sticks, pointing first to Putin and the pandemic, now to an ultra MAGA agenda. But hit pause on the politics. What about the plan, especially with gas prices skyrocketing? We've got more on that. Plus, why the Treasury Secretary now says overturning Roe versus Wade could, could make things worse for the economy. And we've got new details on that Alabama inmate in custody, his plans to get into a shootout with police, and why officials say it was corrections officer Vicki White, who's now dead, who orchestrated this whole scheme. And flu cases are peaking after March for the first time in something like four decades. And doctors aren't so sure why. We'll talk about what you need to know to keep yourself healthy. Plus, lawyers for the Grammy award-winning rapper Young Thug say he is innocent after dozens of gang-related charges against him, including murder. Why Atlanta prosecutors say he's a key part of their push to crack down on street crime. And we'll show you how one team of researchers is trying to connect with underserved black communities to find out more about how the opioid epidemic's impacting them. That's in the original on this National Fentanyl Awareness Day later on in the show. We got a lot to get to tonight. Hey, I'm Hallie. And today, President Biden is trying to reassure all of us that rising costs are at the top of his to-do list as what you're paying every day for the stuff that you need gets higher and higher all the time. Take gas prices, right? Look at this. Today, they're hitting 4.37 a gallon. That's among the highest it has ever been, up nearly 20 cents from just last week. The president saying he gets it. He understands why Americans are frustrated. Watch. I don't blame them. I really don't blame them. There's a lot we have to do. What I have to do is explain in simple, straightforward language what's going on. And what he says is going on is that Russia's war with Ukraine and the pandemic are what's behind these price hikes, not to mention a Senate that won't give him enough votes to pass his agenda. So the president's laying out his plan, a lot of which, if you've been watching the show, you've probably already heard a lot about here. Like, for example, releasing more from the country's gas reserves, fixing loopholes with the Affordable Care Act, calling on Congress to raise taxes on the wealthiest Americans and on corporations. But the president's also making a pretty clear political pivot calling out what he describes as the ultra MAGA wing of the Republican Party and telling Americans they're not going to like the alternative. That's the proposal from this man, Senator Rick Scott of Florida. He's in Republican leadership. And earlier this year, he laid out a tax plan that would set up a minimum federal income tax, which would force hundreds of millions of low income Americans to pay more taxes. By the way, Senator Scott's responding. You see it here. He's calling the president incoherent, incapacitated and confused and calling on President Biden to resign. Shannon Pettypiece is outside the White House for us. Okay, Shannon, so let's talk about the White House framing there, because the president has tried the Putin price hike. He's pointed to the pandemic. Now it's this ultra MAGA agenda, right? MAGA meaning make America great again, a reference to former President Donald Trump. What is the White House ultimately hoping for when it comes to this inflation pitch? Right. Well, clearly, Hallie, we're entering into the compare and contrast stage of messaging here. As you noted, there was nothing new that the president was announcing today. He highlighted a number of things he says his administration has been doing in recent months. He emphasized that this is a priority for his administration, which I will say it has been, of a, pro been a bit of a process inside the White House to get to the point where inflation is really a number one issue. You think back to the fall, it was something they were saying was transitory. They were downplaying a bit of things like increases in costs around the Thanksgiving dinner. They now clearly are, are very focused on inflation. They acknowledge and see that it is a top issue for voters. Voters overwhelmingly give the president low marks for his handling of inflation and the economy. And so while there's not much the administration can do policy-wise at this point, there's not a magic wand they can wave. Uh, they don't have control over Congress in the way they would like to. They are now entering this messaging stage of saying, you know, well, this is what we're doing. We're trying our best, but the other guy's plan would be even worse. And that is where you enter this Rick Scott plan that the White House has really been focused on the past few weeks. Uh, is that a plan that seems like it would come to fruition, even if Republicans did take control of Congress, because it does not have enough support, even among Republicans? But the White House is turning to that, pointing out how it would increase taxes for low-income Americans by setting a minimum tax standard, and the White House using that to say, uh, you know, we are taking efforts in this area. If the Republicans were in control, their message is that your costs would even go up because there would be a tax increase. Incre increasingly, more and more White House officials are signaling that the midterm message is going to be, here's what we're doing. Yeah. You might not be thrilled with it, but it's better than what you'd see from the other guys. Real quick, um, Shannon, how much are they bracing for the drop of this 
what we call CPI report, basically this inflation index report that's coming up, which is going to show where inflation is in this country. It's probably not going to be a record high, but it's experts think it's going to be higher than most Americans want to see. Right. And there's an acknowledgement from the White House at this point that inflation's not clearing up in the next month or two. There's an acknowledgement that the numbers uh, coming tomorrow and even the months from now are not going to be what Americans are hoping for. The president was asked to predict how much longer he expects inflation could persist. He didn't give a prediction, but he cited economists saying this could go on throughout the rest of the year or it could go on into next year. So the White House clearly trying to get ahead of these numbers a signal that they are aware of it. It is a problem they are trying to do something about and at the same time put a little blame on Republicans and try and put some pressure there uh, on Republicans to offer some sort of counter proposal. Shannon Pettypiece live outside the White House. Shannon, thank you. We mentioned that key piece of data on inflation and ahead of that today, kind of a roller coaster for the markets with the Dow in the end falling for a fourth day when everything closed. Check it out, down about another 100 points. The S&P is up a smidge, NASDAQ up a smidge to about 100 points. Nothing close to those crazy downward spirals we've seen over the last couple of days, right? Seema Modi joins us now. Um, so Seema, you know, some, some meh news from the markets, if you will. We're looking ahead at this consumer price index report tomorrow for the month of April. You have the Treasury Secretary telling, you know, members of Congress today, she, she really can't put a timeline on when things could improve. Um, what should we be looking for? How should we be thinking about all this as a whole? Well, the market is still searching for direction, Hallie. Uh, to your point, tech stocks like Microsoft, Intel, Apple led Tuesday's gains, allowing for the NASDAQ to rebound. The sector, of course, has suffered some of the biggest losses in recent weeks as investors move out of growth into safe haven sectors because of these ongoing recessionary fears. Uh, meanwhile, names like IBM and Home Depot fell around 2%. That continues to drag down on the Dow. Can I ask you, because we, we mentioned Secretary Yellen, she was at this hearing today on uh, yeah. the Capitol Hill, and she was asked by a Democratic senator about the relationship between the economy and reproductive rights. And she had this answer. Let me play it. I believe that eliminating the right of women to make decisions about when and whether to have children would have very damaging effects. Um, on the economy and would set women back decades. So a very damaging impact on the economy. She was citing things like, for example, the ability for women to plan and balance families and careers, et cetera. Um, how, and earning potential for women, how much, when you talk to economic experts, do they bring up the potential overturning of Roe versus Wade? Because one Republican senator said today he thought it was kind of callous, in his view, Tim Scott, to frame reproductive rights as it relates to the economy. No, there's research that backs up uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's remarks today. Those were, of course, in response to uh, New Jersey Senator Menendez, a question about the impact of, of that on, on women and their ability, their upward mobility in the corporate world. She said not only will it have a damaging effect on the economy, but that it will enable women, not enable women to finish school and increase their earnings potential. She also said that denying women access to abortion uh, increases their odds of living in poverty or need for public assistance. So it, clearly it's something that's being watched very closely by corporate America as well. Yeah. Um, can I just go back quickly to the inflation numbers before I let you go? Because if we, yeah. I like to help people understand and I like to understand myself, what's the number we should be looking for tomorrow? I know I don't have a crystal ball and I don't have an advanced scoop on what it is, but, but what is the prediction? Just so we have a sense of gauging, you know, when this does get dropped, you know, what, what kind of a sense of where it is on the spectrum? So the golden number is 8.1%. That's what economists are expecting. But what's more important is that if you look back at March, we saw an 8.5% increase in consumer prices. If the number in April is higher than that, that will fuel concerns that the Federal Reserve will raise rates faster than expected. If it cools down and is below 8.5, some economists may say inflation has peaked. But where we are seeing prices increase the most will be in the, the, the subcategory. So housing, rent, Got travel, it. transportation, those those specific numbers will also be key. Man, housing and transportation. Talk about stuff that, like, everybody across the country cares about. Seema Modi, thank you yes. so much from CNBC. Good to see you. Here in Washington, members of Congress are getting closer to giving more money to Ukrainians with a vote tonight to approve President Biden's big aid package. He initially wanted $33 billion, but on Capitol Hill, that didn't seem to be enough for them. House Democrats are looking at nearly $40 billion for Ukraine. A ton of money. You can see it here for the military, plus economic, humanitarian, food assistance aid in plain English, getting hungry people what they need to survive. Not too long ago, uh, actually just within the last couple hours, I talked with the Pentagon press secretary, John Kirby, who says this money really can't come soon enough. Listen. 
how urgent is it that this gets done? In other words, if it gets held up much longer, could that yeah. pause or slow the flow of weapons that the U.S. has been providing? It sure could. I mean, we'd love to see this uh, move quickly. We're glad to see that it's uh, moving to the House floor today. That's very encouraging. And Speaker Pelosi has been uh, nothing but encouraging in what she has said about the urgency that I know she feels. And we also believe, and, and you can see it for yourself, that there's bipartisan support for continuing to help Ukraine. So urgency, the key word there for the Pentagon press secretary. Let me bring in Garrett Haake on Capitol Hill. Garrett, it's not every day that you see the White House ask for a certain amount of money and then Congress goes, sure, plus here's more. Oh, Hallie, I lost the second half of your question here, but I can tell you that it may not be every day on uh, those kind of requests, but it is the second time we've seen this happen with Ukraine aid specifically. This was also the case with the last White House re request that came to Congress. They ended up adding more money to it. That speaks to how popular it is in both parties right now to be seen as supporting Ukraine and supporting that war effort. It was this afternoon when Mitch McConnell said he was the one who called President Biden uh, last week and said, we got to separate this from other issues so that we can move expeditiously on it. So we got the House vote expected tonight. The Senate, uh, moving fast in the Senate means a different thing than it might mean to you or I. They may get to this by the end of this week, but this bill probably gets to the president's desk with all that extra money sometime early next week at the latest. And that is exactly what the press, Pentagon press secretary said they need to see before the third week of May. I see you nodding. I think you can hear me, right, Gare? Yep. Let me ask you then about the other big piece of this, which is something that's happening tonight. And I actually don't know the timing on this. Speaker Pelosi is going to the Situation Room today, tonight, to brief President Biden, along with other members of Congress who were with her on a recent trip to Ukraine, about what they saw on the ground. And this is interesting because this is the president, it seems, really seeking um, a personal discussion, right, from people who were in Ukraine about what can best be done to help moving forward. Do you know anything more about this or the timing? We don't know the timing. I mean, look, Speaker Pelosi is the highest ranking figure in the United States government who has gone personally to Kyiv and who has met with President Zelensky. She did so for several hours, and she did it with members with whom she is both personally close and who have very specific expertise on this. Of course, Adam Schiff, the chairman of the Intel Committee. Jason Crow, who's not a chairman of anything, but he's become very involved in the military matters here, particularly in how to supply Ukraine with weapons. These are close conversations that apparently she's going to want to brief very closely with the president. It's uh, highly unusual to see a Speaker of the House go to the White House for something that the White House even advertises as a meeting in the Situation Room right. on an issue like this. I think it's kind of surprising that this is a trip that the Speaker was on more than a week ago and this is only happening now. But it does suggest to me is? some sense. Uh, it, it would be purely speculation for me to guess. It could be a matter as simple as the schedules. It could be a matter of, you know, keeping the principles apart until they're sure that nobody's coming coming back with COVID. That's been an issue on some of these codels to Ukraine in the past. Uh, but the fact that it's happening at the White House in the Situation yeah. Room speaks to a level of sensitivity around these discussions that, uh, you know, you don't often see. Garrett Haig, live for us on The Hill. Good to see you, Garrett. Thank you. We talk about what's happening in Ukraine. Let's look at what's happening on the ground, because tonight rescue workers there are trying to figure out just how much damage has been done in the city of Odessa after they got hit with Russian missiles overnight, seven of them to be exact. They hit a shopping center and a warehouse, killing at least one person, hurting five others. Odessa is important for Ukraine. OK, this is a place where weapons sent from the U.S. and from Europe are stored. It's also a port city that's key to the Ukrainian economy. And all of it's coming as the U.N. is releasing some really stark numbers showing just how devastating this war has been on the people of Ukraine, saying some 3,000 civilians, innocent people, have been killed. At least 238 of them are children. Cal Perry is joining us now. And Cal, um, let's talk about what's happening in Odessa here, right? We talked about how this city is so important to the Ukrainian economy, an economy that's now projected to shrink by 30 percent this year. Clearly, the Russians are targeting it for a reason. Yeah, this is uh, the third largest city in Ukraine, third most populous, I should say, and it is the major port city. This is where most of the exports go out of. Um, and look, sea trade is is vital uh, to this country. We have updated numbers, by the way, from the president. It turns out 25 rockets, he said, fired at Odessa in just two days, on May 8th and May 9th. So seven on May 9th, and then a whole batch of rockets were fired the day before. People here are fearful that you know, Odessa could turn into a Mariupol type thing. You have uh, shelling from the sea um, and you have Russians surrounding that city and basically now starting to lay siege to it, uh, which is exactly what we saw uh, in Mariupol, Hallie. 
Let me talk about these U.N. numbers, because, you know, you look at the number of people hurt or killed in this war, more than 7,000 innocent people. You've got millions of others who have been displaced inside and outside the country. Um, you have been on the ground there. As our viewers will know, we've seen you almost every night now for weeks. You've seen the situation evolve on the front line when it comes to civilians affected. Yeah, and, and I would say that it's a massive undercount from the United Nations. Yeah. We are out every day almost, tur you know, sort of touring the suburbs of Kiev. And, and, and we, along with the groups that we are with, um, are finding bodies, um, not just the bodies of Ukrainian civilians and fighters, but the bodies of, of Russian soldiers as well. And the United Nations says, you know, Mariupol is a black hole. They don't know how many civilians were killed there. Local government officials say it could be as high as 20,000 people. I'll tell you, in uh, Luhansk, in the region there, um, in the eastern part of the country, there was an apartment building building today uh, that was discovered with the bodies of 44 people in it that was shelled weeks ago, Hallie. So you have the accounting of a war still just underway here. Um, and that's why the U.N. says it, it's a massive undercount, that yeah. figure of, of roughly 7,000 civilian killed. It's going to be it's going to be far higher, unfortunately. And again, with the millions of people displaced, so much of this is about reuniting people and finding out what happened. It's also part of why it's so chilling when you hear a top intelligence official, as we did today, the director of national intelligence, say that Russia is preparing for a prolonged conflict. Cal, I mean, we're looking at months potentially months yeah. more of this. Cal Perry, live for us there in Ukraine tonight. Cal, thank you. Back to news here at home. And we are just learning today some r very startling new details about that days-long manhunt for an Alabama inmate who escaped with a corrections officer, that he planned to get into a shootout with police if they were in danger of being caught, according to what we heard from the sheriff today. They were, of course, taken into custody before that happened, when officers closed in on Casey White and Vicki White yesterday. After a car chase, they hit a ditch. This ditch actually helped us in the pursuit because as they forcibly rammed the vehicle, it turned over on its side and that disrupted his plan to try to have a shootout with law enforcement. And he even made that statement. The sheriff said these two had $29,000 in cash, some wigs with them, and then what you just saw on screen, four handguns and an AR-15. Casey White, check it out, this is his new mugshot, was shackled and in a bright yellow prison uniform, yellow rather, when he showed up by video in an Indiana courtroom today. He waived his extradition rights. He's now headed back to Alabama. And tonight, the Vanderburg County coroner is working to confirm that the corrections officer, Vicki White, did die by suicide before police were able to take her into custody. Megan Fitzgerald is joining us now. And Megan, this story has had so many twists and turns, right? The, the police think that Vicki White, orchest the corrections officer, orchestrated this whole thing. So what was, like, what was the plan? Because there was a plan. What was the grand plan for these two? Yeah, Hallie, that's the question. Uh, the sheriff was asked that today earlier at a press conference, and he said they didn't really have a plan. They were here in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, they were going to stay here for at least two weeks. Um, they were contemplating their next move. Uh, they were trying to stay out of the public eye, but they really didn't have a concrete plan. There was no family on either side um, here in this area. And remember, we're talking about a woman who was number two at the correctional facility down in Alabama. Uh, she was expected to win um, or be awarded, rather, employee of the week next week. That's something that her colleagues vote on. She was uh, regarded as the mother of that facility there. And uh, even the sheriff himself was completely uh, taken off guard that she would do something like this. And, and that's the big question at this hour is why would she do something like that? And it's, it's, it's very obvious that we may never know that answer. Right. I mean, you mentioned that they, what little we know of the plan is that they were going to spend a couple of weeks at this hotel in Evansville because police say they paid for 14 days. They saved right. for six. A lot a lot of people in and around Evansville say they saw yep. them. This was such a huge, I mean, we covered it on this show, it was on Nightly on the Today Show, right? This was everywhere, this yep. manhunt. People seem to have recognized them. Yeah, absolutely. And that was exactly what law enforcement wanted. They wanted to get these pictures out as fast as they possibly could. They wanted tips to come pouring in. And that's exactly what happened here. A tip came in from uh, Evansville, Indiana on Sunday. That's what led investigators to this community here. Uh, it was from a guy who saw something suspicious, a vehicle that was abandoned. He went back through his uh, surveillance video, the owner of this car wash. He saw something. It triggered something for him. He called law enforcement. I want you to take a listen to what he had to say. I said, this is probably that guy from Alabama. I, as soon as I see him, I mean, the windows are down, keys in ignition, perfectly good truck. Why would you throw away, walk away from a good truck? She had her hair dyed, so you couldn't really tell the difference. You could have a full conversation with her and not even know. 
Yeah, and Hallie, the fact that the sheriff here in Evansville didn't even know that these folks were in his community uh, certainly caught him off guard, too. But he said he's just thankful uh, that the community stepped up, helped them to try and get these guys. So what's Hallie? the next piece of this now, Megan? Obviously, we're waiting still on results from the autopsy report. Does Casey White go back to the facility right. that he escaped from? So right now he is in transit back to Alabama where he is expected to uh, be in court tonight. And it's possible that we might even get footage of that. Um, so we're still waiting to find out exactly what happens with him. Um, but we know that there is a, a autopsy investigation that's going on right now. And we should learn at some point, we'll get that report uh, to, to really determine exactly how um, Vicki White died. But again, Sheriff's office telling us that they believe that she died from a gunshot wound to her head. Megan Fitzgerald, live for us in Evansville. Megan, thank you. Turning now to Mexico, where the killings of two more journalists in a single day had people out in the streets demonstrating, protesting after the deaths of Yesenia Molinero Falcone and Sheila Johanna Garcia Oliveira, who reported for an online news site. They were both shot and killed yesterday outside a convenience store in Veracruz. Those deaths coming just days after the killing of journalist Luis Enrique Ramirez Ramos. His body was found Thursday on a dirt road in the state of Sinaloa. Eleven journalists have already been killed in Mexico this year alone. It is the deadliest country in the world to be a journalist outside of war zones, according to the Press Freedom Group, Article 19. Mexican president, uh, the Mexican president has promised, quote, zero impunity because he wants to investigate these killings. But critics say it's just not enough. Steve Patterson is joining us now. And Steve, um, these protests, I think, had come together initially for the killing of a journalist last week in a horrific turn of events. It ended up being a demonstration against these two more recent killings as well. Incredible to think that the people had already gathered right. to protest the brutal death of Ramirez a week ago. Amazing to think that they not only gathered to protest for the death of one journalist, but wound up for three journalists. And so often what has happened here is there's just a lack of information about the crimes themselves. We know that the state's attorney general's office is working with the governor's office, is working with the prosecutor's office to try to figure out what happened here. They say they are investigating not only who did did this, but the manner in which they did it and why they did it, but also looking at what the journalists were investigating that may have led to these crimes. But so often, what happens is these crimes go unsolved. They are criminally under-prosecuted. And it seems that if you are the loved one of a journalist in Mexico, that justice is really hard to come by. We'll see what happens here, though. One of the things that's the dynamic that underpins this, from, from what critics say, they will point to the Mexican president who say, his attacks, his public attacks on journalists who report on his administration, who, you know, take issue or exception with his administration, um, are fueling some of this. The government has said, wait a second, no, the, this is crime cartels. W what's the reality? Steve, so gut check us here. Well, look, I mean, the, there's nothing to say that these attacks from the cartels are obscene and the traffickers are obscene and the, the narcos in that country. It's an especially bad situation. But, you know, often what is found is that some of these attacks are politically motivated. And no matter what the cause is, what certainly doesn't help are consistent, incessant verbal attacks from the person at the top of the country. You and I know what kind of environment that can create for journalists uh, in this this country. So to have a place where people are actually dying and this president is still verbally attacking journalists in an unsafe situation over there, it's just incredible to think about. A number of human rights organizations have begged him to stop. International uh, journalist organizations have tried to get him to stop, but he's not. And since 2018, since he took office, one agency has reported that attacks on the press have increased by 85 percent, Hallie. It is not stopping in that country. Has it had a chilling effect on journalism there? I, you know, it has to have. I, I mean, hmm. I can't imagine that you're a parent and you want your kid to be a journalist in a country like Mexico. Uh, and if you're talking about the kinds of journalists that are getting killed, a lot of times these are local news, hyper local news. These are people that are in the public works meetings, in the city council meetings, people that the community knows and is familiar with and rely upon that information from these journalists. And the fact that they're getting killed uh, alongside everybody else in that 
that country. It is a dark spot for journalism and a dark spot for democracy. It yeah. is a tragedy whenever anybody dies. But to have journalists die like this and then the next generation be dissuaded from doing work that is important for the function of democracy, it's a really bad situation over there. Steve Patterson, Allie. thank you so much for bringing this to our yep. attention and for shining a spotlight on it. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, rapper Young Thug arrested on gang-related charges. Why officials are accusing him of being linked to organized crime. And what else you should know about this kind of thing, bigger picture. Plus, we don't say this a lot. It's almost summer, but flu season is still going strong. That's kind of strange. We're going to explain why and what doctors are saying after the break. One of the biggest rappers in the world who had a number one album last year has now been indicted on charges of criminal gang activity. We're talking about Grammy winner Young Thug, whose real name is Jeffrey Williams, a founder of a gang called Young Slime Life, a group prosecutors are tying to murder, robbery, drugs, and more, they say. It's part of a big indictment in Atlanta that includes more than 25 other people besides Young Thug, including the well-known rapper Gunna. Young Thug's lawyers say he's innocent. The district attorney is promising now, pledging to crack down on street gangs and crime, and she's not alone. Elected officials all around the country are trying to fight a rise in gun violence, with the CD saying just today that the homicide rate, the gun homicide rate specifically, is the highest it's been in 25 years. I want to bring in Ron Allen now to talk about all of this. So, so Ron, you know, big names here, Young Thug, Gunna, they're accused of violating Georgia's RICO statute, which is designed to stop organized crime. Explain how this would, how prosecutors say this would connect or apply to them. Well, the prosecutors said, interestingly, that the RICO statute, which is essentially this racketeering law, lets the jury see the totality of what was going on in this uh, alleged criminal enterprise. And you're right, the, the indictment ran some 88 pages. There are some 56 different counts that are listed um, involving a total of 28 individuals, crimes like witness intimidation, murder, attempted murder, carjackings, robbery, all this going on, allegedly, from... Uh, 2012 or so over the past decade and they put young thug at the top of this as essentially the founder and leader of this organization saying that he was mindful of all that was going on and that he was doing things to encourage this and to orchestrate all this and that essentially he was uh, 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 like the leader of an organized crime mob there the uh, da fannie willis said that street gangs in atlanta and the area are responsible for 75 to 80 percent of the violent crime that's happening in that area. And she's cracking down. And he is target number one, along with these other 27 or 28 right. individuals. We did get a statement from his attorney, which we should say, uh, Brian Steele, he said, Mr. Williams has committed no violation of law whatsoever. We will fight this case ethically, legally, zealously. Mr. Williams will be cleared. I, I, we'll see. I wonder, Ron, about this, um, this, this issue that, that comes up, right, of, of prosecutors maybe planning to use some of Young Thug's lyrics against him. And does that raise free speech issues, et cetera? What were prosecutors saying about that piece of it? Well, when you look through the indictment, there's not a lot of evidence listed, but there are nine songs that are highlighted, and there are also a lot of social media posts that are highlighted by the prosecutors, essentially as evidence is trying to use young thug and others words against them for example um, there's a song called anybody from 2018 and there's a lyric that says i never killed anybody but i got something to do with that body now is that incriminating or is that as an artist would say an expression of creative creativity and so on and so forth another one there's a song that's called just how it goes and the lyric says gave the lawyer close to two mil he handles all the killings so again these are the kinds of things that have been brought up in not just in this particular case, but in many cases across the country where, again, prosecutors are trying to crack down on street gangs, yeah. on rappers, and they're trying to use their words against them. Uh, the courts tend to uphold this. The prosecutor said that uh, she's very mindful of the First Amendment, but the First Amendment can't be used to commit criminal acts. And so the way that uh, the lyrics and the words are included in the in indictment, they're listed as what are called overt or overt acts to in furtherance of a conspiracy 
conspiracy, which is a lot of legal mumble jumbo. But essentially, they're not saying you're guilty because you said these things. You're guilty because you said these things and these other things, murders, other crimes happened. Right. And that's essentially what they're trying to do here. Before I have to let you go, Ron, in the minute we have left, pull back a little bit because you, you referenced how this is happening in, not just in Atlanta, but more broadly, right? In this push to try to get a handle in some of these cities on rising gun violence. We mentioned those gun homicide rates that the CDC released today. Can you tell us more about that from like the sort of broader perspective? The gun homicide rates were astronomical. They were the highest they've been in 25 years. And the group that is hit the hardest, that's hurt the most, are young black men, age 18 to 34, I believe it is. Also, amongst those, those killings, the suicide rate has remained the same, but it's the homicide rate that has really jumped up. And we've seen this in big cities, small cities across the country. Um, it's a really striking number. This case has something to do with that. I mean, it's, it's uh, the charges of some of these other individuals that they're facing include murder, attempted murder. One of the charges that specifically against young thug involves a case that goes back about five years or so where he allegedly rented a car that was used as a used in a drive-by shooting and of course there are critics of people like young thug who say that rap artists and others are glorifying violence and so forth and that's contributing to yeah. this culture they of course push back at that very hard as do others but yes all these things are intertwined and this case is really um, it, it's really significant 88 pages 56 crimes 28 individuals that's a lot and Young Thug. I mean, huge, huge name getting so much attention. Ron Allen, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, anti-government protests are getting bigger in Sri Lanka one day after the country's prime minister resigned. Demonstrators are blaming him and his brother, the president, for the country's worst economic crisis in decades. There's actually a nationwide curfew in effect now to try and calm everybody down. Number two, Shanghai, taking even more steps now to fight an Omicron outbreak under China's zero COVID policy. Teams there entering homes of infected people. They're literally going inside people's houses to spray disinfectant. They've shut down all the subway lines. People there say they're frustrated. They were hoping that the more than month long lockdown at this point would be starting to ease up instead of the opposite. Number three, Tesla recalling nearly 130,000 cars over some touchscreen displays overheating. This is a problem that could make that center screen go blank. That's where the rearview camera display is, et cetera. That makes it more likely you could get into a crash. The company says it's going to try to fix this with a software update. Number four, Fox Sports says Tom Brady is going to join the network as its lead NFL analyst after he's done playing football. You heard about this? So the Tampa Bay Bucks could see their quarterback stepping into this new role as soon as next year. Remember, in the fall, he's still the quarterback for the Bucks, but he's just getting his ducks in a row, I guess, for when he's done. He could make more than $375 million, according to one report, over 10 years. You heard that right. Number five, Andy Warhol's famous portrait of Marilyn Monroe. Speaking of big money, selling for $195 million at a New York auction. If you're looking at your screen, you, you just saw that portrait. It's super duper famous. Shot Sage Blue Maryland, one of his most famous pieces. This is now the record for the work by an American artist sold at auction. Turning now to a story that has some doctors a little bit confused, because here we are. Memorial Day weekend is upon us in a couple of weeks. It's almost summer. But we're still seeing the flu spreading all across the country. This is the first time since before I was born that we've seen an increase this big this late in the season. Last time we saw this was 1982. The CDC says one in 10 positive flu tests were reported in mid-April. But even with that uptick, CDC data shows this year's flu season is still below where it was pre-pandemic. So that's a mitigating factor. Let me bring in Erica Edwards. So Erica, why, right? Like, why is this happening now, this later flu surge than we've seen before? Well, I was born by then. However, it is still super wild to be talking about the flu in mid-May. Experts I've talked with say that this increase generally has coincided with, you know, the fact that we're relaxing mitigation measures such as masking when it comes to COVID-19. Um, and so maybe, you know, the flu that's been simmering over the past year is now sort of coming to a boil in certain areas of the country like Colorado and New Mexico. Nationwide, however, the CDC estimates that so far this season we have seen as many as 5.7 million cases of the flu, uh, nearly 60,000 hospitalizations related to the flu, and about 3,600 deaths, including 24 children, Hadley. That's just an astronom astron astronomical number. However, despite those that this recent uptick, 
this is still far below what we would normally see in a typical flu right. season. Hallie? I think if you're watching this, you're going, okay, well, wait a second. If I've got a fever, my body hurts, I don't feel good, we're like in this moment. Is it allergies? Is it the flu? Is it COVID? And especially when you look at COVID versus the flu, is it just the test, the COVID test that would tell you the difference here? And, and why is that important to know and to understand? Yeah, so that's really the tough question here, because as you said, the symptoms can be very similar. Uh, they're both respiratory illnesses. They both spread the same way. They both have many of the same symptoms, fever, uh, chill, muscle aches, sore throat, fatigue. Anecdotally, I'm hearing that people who are now being diagnosed with COVID, I'm um, sorry, with the flu, uh, or sorry, of COVID-19 are generally experiencing the same loss of taste and smell as we heard previously in the mm -hmm. pandemic. That's still happening with these Omicron variants. But as you said, you know, uh, the reason to get tested right now is because we have different antivirals specific to either the flu or COVID-19. So the earlier that you can get tested, know what's really going on, the better you will be during the course of your illness. Because Tell you know me. which drugs to take to hopefully try to make you feel better. Erica Edwards, makes sense. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Coming up here on the show, former President Trump's influence over the Republican Party put to the test in two primaries today. We're on the ground in West Virginia with more on that next. And speaking of Mr. Trump, Elon Musk says he'll remove the permanent ban on the former president when he takes over Twitter. We've got more on that ahead. Elon Musk today making headlines by saying he would remove the ban that keeps former President Trump off Twitter if his deal to buy Twitter goes through. Musk called Mr. Trump's ban a mistake, saying it alienated a lot of the country. And the Twitter co-founder, Jack Dorsey, seemed to agree, tweeting today, permanent bans are a failure of ours and don't work. Remember, the former president was permanently suspended from Twitter in January of last year after that attack on the Capitol by his supporters and his lies about what happened about it. He said publicly last month that he would not rejoin the social media platform, even if Musk were to lift the ban. He says he's doing his own thing on Truth Social. He's also doing a lot as it relates to the Republican Party, trying to maintain his grip. And that is going to be put to the test with a couple of primaries today, West Virginia and Nebraska, the latest races that will have GOP voters deciding whether to back the Trump-endorsed candidate or not. Look at what's happening in West Virginia. You have two incumbent congressmen fighting for one seat. That's because of redistricting. They took these two districts, lumped them together. So now you have Congressman Alex Mooney going up against Congressman David McKinley, basically. Mooney has called the January 6th insurrection just a protest. He rejected the certification of the legitimate 2020 election results. McKinley's more moderate. He voted for President Biden's 2020 bipartisan infrastructure package, and he's been endorsed by some Democrats. Then you've got what's going down in Nebraska. Voters looking to elect a new governor. Two GOP frontrunners, Charles Herbster, accused of sexual harassment by eight women, which he denies. He's been endorsed by Mr. Trump. And then there's Jim Pillen, a hog farmer and university board member endorsed by Nebraska's current governor. Joining me now is Vaughn Hilliard. Vaughn, I really want to focus in on West Virginia here because this isn't the marquee headline test of Donald Trump's endorsement necessarily. That is going to come, I think, next week in Pennsylvania, probably the week after in Georgia. But it is... Um, can we call it the appetizer primary, Vaughn? Like, is that appropriate here? Because that's kind of what it feels like here, coming down to a, a Trump-endorsed yeah. candidate and a non-Trump-endorsed, Trump-backed candidate, I should say, who's, who's more embraced in bipartisanship. Absolutely. We can go with appetizer. I mean, this is part of a, a systematic effort for uh, Donald Trump to essentially consolidate power within Republican Party ahead of a potential 2024 presidential run. There's a list of Republican incumbents, including, you know, the likes of the governor and secretary of state in Georgia, the likes of Liz Cheney in Wyoming. But David McKinley, one of the two candidates in this list, is on the race. He voted not only to certify the 2020 election, but he also voted for what would have been an independent January 6th commission to uh, uh, investigate the insurrection. You mentioned it. He also voted for the bipartisan infrastructure package. And that is really where he comes to a head with Alex Mooney here, the Trump's back candidate. And you can just see, uh, look at the endorsements of the two individuals. I mean, you have Democrat Joe Manchin backing David McKinley in this race. On the other side with Alex Mooney, not only is it Donald Trump, you've also got the likes of Colorado Congresswoman uh, Lauren Boebert. And it's important to, you know, redistricting has changed uh, uh, where a lot of people are voting and who they have to vote for. And when you're looking in West Virginia, they used to have three congressional districts. They're down to now two, which is why Mooney and McKinley are going at it. I want to let you hear from some of the voters, though, Hallie, that we talked to who are weighing which one to choose. 
David McKinley. David McKinley, why? Because I think he's an honest, genuine man. Did the Trump endorsement make you question it all? No, no, Reagan? I didn't listen to any of that either way. Trump endorsed Mooney, so I'll probably go with Mooney. Hallie, on paper, when you look at this race, McKinley, he was first elected here locally back in 1980 to the state legislature. And essentially his old district is makes up most of this new district. Yet Donald Trump's endorsement. And you just heard from those voters. To what extent could it potentially tip the scale in Alex Mooney's favor? That's what we're looking for. Tonight. What's also kind of interesting, though, didn't David McKinley, doesn't he have a voting record that is more consistent with Donald Trump backed policies than Alex Mooney? That's accurate. Actually, 92% of the time over the course of Donald Trump's four years, he voted with uh, Donald Trump compared to 86% for Alex Mooney. But it's a couple of those key votes that Donald Trump has consistently given attention yeah. to. The certification of the election, the January 6th commission, those were the votes that Donald Trump remembers. Vaughn Hilliard, um, you, it's an interesting assignment for you. I know you're going to be out there all night looking for these results, and we'll see you next week for some of those other key primaries, too. Appreciate it, friend. Still ahead, police in Miami are looking into a car crash that ended up in a huge fire. Look at that, we got more in the local. Plus, researchers are hoping a certain group of people can help them fight the opioid epidemic. We'll explain in tonight's original, next. The verdict is in, in Mario Batali, the celebrity chef's sexual misconduct case. How the judge ruled in just a minute. But first, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our West Coast Bureau, Stanford University says it's investigating a noose hanging from a tree as a hate crime. It was found over the weekend outside a residence hall, basically a dorm. It's the third time this has happened at the school. University officials say they will not tolerate hate symbols on campus. From our Southeast Bureau, one person is in the hospital after a car crash outside a gas station in Miami. So the car slammed into a tractor trailer and then this huge fire happened. Um, amazingly, both drivers got out without getting hurt too badly. Police say they're still trying to figure out what caused the crash. Also from our Southeast Bureau, a scary surprise for a North Texas guy who reached into his toolbox and saw this. A copperhead snake. He got bitten. Dude was just looking for a wrench, you know? This snake is three feet long. It's venomous. It's poisonous. It was coiled around some tools. The man says he's lucky doing okay. The bite was dry, meaning there was no venom in that particular bite. Thank goodness. A first-of-its-kind trial against some of the biggest pharmacy chains in the country is starting today in Ohio. The goal here? To figure out what Walgreens, CVS, and Walmart owe for their role in the opioid epidemic. Back in November, a federal jury decided the companies did fuel the drug crisis, that they were culpable, but the companies deny that. They say they're going to appeal the verdict. In the trial starting today, the two Ohio counties involved want Walgreens, CVS, and Walmart to address the opioid epidemic in their areas by paying more than $800 million over five years, money that would go towards solutions, et cetera, according to a lawyer representing the counties. We're taking a closer look at the opioid crisis in tonight's original, with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And today is the nation's first ever fentanyl overdose awareness day. And it comes as overdose deaths in this country are surging. At the University of Kentucky, a team of researchers is trying to take on this head on, specifically by going around. They want to hear from black Americans and their struggles with drug use. It's a demographic experts say it can be hard to reach, partly because of lack of representation they see in the people researching them. Kathy Park has more on this team's unique approach. Olivia, who, in the interest of maintaining her privacy, asked us to identify her as Olivia M., is a research participant in a groundbreaking study at the University of Kentucky. I have been stalked. I've been beaten and left for dead outside of a strip club. I have been stranded in an entirely different state. It took a lot of falling down and going to different places until I found things that worked for me. Her story shared with this unique team on a mission to tackle the opioid epidemic, equipped with t-shirts, flyers, and an open mind. One of the things we're very intentional about as a research team is to literally speak with people face to face. That connection, <laughs> allowing them to make breakthroughs with underserved black communities, reluctant to open up to strangers about their drug use. Those barriers related to research and 
accessing black populations for research are oftentimes there because the researchers do not look like the communities. And so there is suspicion, there's issues of trust. Researchers say a year into the study, their approach is working, with participants getting candid with the team made up of mostly black women. And people see our t-shirts and they're like, oh, you are the refocus team, like we've heard about you. For them, this isn't just about the data. I'm just curious, how many of you personally have been impacted by family members or peers who have abused drugs? It's the majority of you guys. With the nation's war on drugs deepening, last month the Biden administration sent its national drug control strategy to Congress, focusing on harm reduction and treatment. Once you lose reasoning, you lose faculty. And that's how addiction gets you. According to the CDC, last year nearly 107,000 people died from drug overdoses. One reason for the rise in deaths, fentanyl, a potent synthetic opioid that the agency says is involved in more deaths than any other cause for Americans under 50. Meanwhile, in 2020, the overdose death rate for black Americans surpassed the death rate for white Americans for the first time since 1999. Being a member of the community in which we are working with, we know that this has been a problem in our communities long before 2015. Over a five-year period of research and analysis, the end game at the University of Kentucky is to fill in the information gaps to help decision makers shape local, state, and federal policies. They say that starts with more uncomfortable conversations in a safe space, all with the goal of putting more members of the community on a path toward a healthy recovery. By sharing my experience, I hope that it impacts research in a way in my local community that it helps other people that are like me. Kathy is joining me now to talk more about her reporting. Kathy, you talked about this research. It's already a year in. Can you, can you speak to any kind of broad themes that they've come across so far? Hallie, well, that's a great question. There are a lot of themes that have surfaced so far. Yes, the study is only a year in, but it really varies based on generation. When it comes to some of these older participants, they are leaning on drugs and misusing opioids to, to manage their pain, and it really is a vicious cycle to control that pain they continue to use. Meanwhile, for the younger participants, uh, no surprise here, but researchers are, are finding out that they are being influenced heavily by pop culture, social media, and the music scene. So they're picking up these bad habits through those channels. But another overarching storyline happens to be uh, the sharing of, of medications among households as well as peers, because some providers are actually under prescribing to some members of the black population, Hallie. And, and one of the things that we hear a lot in this kind of research and in this discussion is about breaking the cycle of addiction. And when you look at the participants in this research, talking with, you know, counselors, talking with therapists, et cetera, et cetera, um, what has the impact of that been? Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because a lot of these participants, this happens to be the first time that they're actually getting some yeah. sort of mental health service. So this is the first time that they're opening up and sharing their drug use. And it's also important to note, Hallie, that these researchers are training to be counseling psychologists. So they are leaning on their education and empathy. Uh, so really, this is a learning experience on so many levels. Kathy Park, Hallie. so glad to have you shining a light on this story for us. Appreciate it. Coming up after the break, a not guilty verdict for celebrity chef Mario Batali in that sexual misconduct case. We're going to explain how and why the judge says they came up with that ruling. Coming up. Celebrity chef Mario Batali now cleared on charges he groped a woman at a Boston restaurant. Watch. Commonwealth has not met its burden to the degree that's required by law. I'm going to find the defendant not guilty to the charge of indecent assault and battery. The trial in front of a Boston judge lasted less than two days. Remember, we told you about it starting yesterday. It is already over. His testifier, excuse me, his accuser, I should say, testified Monday that Batali groped and forcibly kissed her back in 2017. But while the judge found that she lacked credibility, he also said Batali, quote, did not cover himself in glory in the night in question, acting in a way the judge says was not becoming of a celebrity. Joyce Mance is joining us now to talk more about this. Um, let, let me get into the, the why and then the what it means, Joy. And, uh, Joyce, let me take it in that order. Tell us more about why the judge made this decision and, and your view of it. 
Sure. So we know that in a criminal prosecution, the government bears the burden of proving a defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So in a case like this where the judge acquits, the judge isn't necessarily saying that the defendant was innocent. The judge is saying, government, you didn't meet your burden of proof. It's the highest burden of proof uh, known in any sort of setting in our legal system, this burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Here the judge rules that the government fails to meet that burden, so the defendant is acquitted. Let's talk about what it means, because Batali stepped down from his restaurant business. This was you know, during the Me Too movement over other sexual harassment accusations. What does a victory mean for him? Sure. You know, it, it's important in the sense that it means he doesn't face the risk of going to prison. He won't have to register as a sex offender for the remainder of his life. He has still paid considerable consequences in the business realm where he's lost his, his restaurants and his businesses, as well as his reputation. And he'll still also, Hallie, face a civil lawsuit from this same woman who has alleged in a civil case that he assaulted her and that she suffered damages. And in that civil case, the burden will be a preponderance of the evidence that it's more likely than not mm. that she's telling the truth. So that's a whole new ball game. Batali has apologized before for his past conduct. Did that play a part in any of this at all? So he apologized in 27. It was sort of a generic apology. And this may well be the reason or one of the reasons that Batali chose to have his case heard by the judge, not by a jury. The judge would be able to make a more nuanced, sophisticated legal decision about the impact of this apology, which was sort of a generic apology for his conduct across the board, rather than being focused on this one incident. There was considerable risk that had that evidence been heard in front of a jury, it might have been admitted, it might not have been, but the jury might have heard it as an apology and held it against Batali in this specific case. So that apology, whether or not it's specific to this incident, gets filtered through the judge's experience and ultimately does not come into play here as a factor that leads to his conviction. Joyce Vance, good to see you. Thank you for that analysis. Appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for watching us for this hour. That is a wrap. We're going to have more for you here tomorrow. Same time, same place, as always. We'll see you on NBC News Now with coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.